Okay, so everyone, welcome to Unity of Chautauqua. And this is our Wednesday night, A Positive Path for Spiritual Living. And tonight we are doing Conscious Aging. So you can see at the bottom there of that screen that um, you can go to our website and learn more about our whole program this summer because we have a lot more Wednesday nights coming. I hope you will join us. And I just wanted to tell you a little about conscious aging because um, kind of I'm approaching that 70th birthday and it's really got me to thinking about what do I want for the next 30 years of my life? Um, What's so interesting is for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, actually, the average age that um, we lived to was about average 35. But now we might spend a third of our year retired. And so the big word I've been using that just I became really aware of is that I'm repurposed. I decided I did retirement for a couple years. And I knew I wanted something more out of that. And so I wanted to look at the aging, not only from the perspective of what culture has taught me and what I need to undo some of it to make this next 30 plus years um, meaningful for me and meaningful for those around me. So I thought I'd start with, with some jokes because this week at Chautauqua, it's joke week. And um, I think I wanted to start with one and you kind of saw a preview of it because I kind of clicked a little early, but I was thinking about the fountain of youth and you can't see that on your, because it looks like my picture's in the way, but that little sign with the butterfly says fountain of youth. And the butterfly takes a drink. And as you see, he says, who turned out the lights? Let me out of here. Um, so that, this cartoon just reminded me, I just copied these out of the paper, the newspaper, and there's a lot of cartoons I wouldn't even want to show about aging, but this one just reminded me of how we spend so much energy in our country around this idea of the fountain of youth. And when I started thinking about what people that were elderly that really made a difference in my lives, they didn't look youthful. And, but they were, their very presence, just being in their presence um, shifted something for me. They were elderly and such an open and loving consciousness that I thought, I want what they have as I age. And so that's part of me doing this tonight is for me to personally um, own more of this repurposing time in my life. So a couple more cartoons for the fun of it. And this is, of course, now with your right eye, which is the smallest squirrel you can see. And I, I've been going through a lot. I, you know, there's those physical changes in our bodies that kind of have slowed me down a little bit. They haven't stopped me, but they've slowed me. And I was thinking about how my dogs age, because I've gone through so many dogs. And my dog would chase a squirrel, no matter how old, if they're hobbling, they would chase a squirrel. So I still want to be squirrel chasing for a while here. And this next one says, um, let's ride that buffalo, feed the bears, and see how close we can get to Old Faithful. You only live once. Um, so this cartoon reminded me of the fact that um, Part of us just wants to have that like second childhood when, and um, be more adventuresome as we age. Um, and it works a little different as we age. And of course, Mother Grease and Grimm, Mother, what do you miss most about the good old days? And she's saying, well, let's see two things. I wasn't old and I sure wasn't good. So, um, yeah, I want to read, uh, <laughs> you look at that there. I saw this quote <clears throat> that was kind of like that. And, um, in fact, actually it goes with the next one a little better. 
This one was on the back of the Humane Society catalog I took a, a picture of because I really liked it. And I thought that part of getting older is also becoming more innocent in a way. Like we've taken off all these layers of we ought to do and we should. And, we, and so perhaps there's part of us that we haven't had time for that just wants to be let out. And so, of course, this is from Bruce Springsteen says, roll up your sleeves and let your passion flow. The country we carry in our hearts is waiting. And actually, this is funny. I had an elderly man in my congregation when I had a church congregation, and he would come up on his motor sc scooter with a dog with goggles and one of those little flap. He'd have one of those hats, those old fashioned hats with the little ears things on them. And so would the dog. So um, that just got my heart. And so a quote I read, which I thought was pretty cool, was um, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in attractive and well preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways, chocolate in one hand, martini in the other, body thoroughly used up, totally worn out and screaming, woohoo, what a ride. So I don't know if that's mine or mine will be a little more quiet, but I like the idea that um, there's so many possibilities. And one of the great parts about aging is that some possibilities you didn't just try to, at different stages in your life, you didn't get to try out. And so now maybe we have an opportunity. Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, said at the age of 94, he said, I fair, fairly sizzle with zeal and with faith step out to do what is mine to do. Of course, just this is a funny little side note, he did die at 94. Um, however, I like the thought that right to that point, he lived in this amazing energetic consciousness. And I don't know how that will work out for me, but I'm willing to put an intention out that that's part of my experience too. And um, uh, I don't know, I might be simmering more than, than um, sizzling, but the one thing I would like to experience in whatever way I can experience is, I want to be this next 30 years to be awesome. And that could be that just a state of consciousness that invites connection. That would be awesome to me. I don't have to be on a motorcycle with my little dog, but. Um, so this kind of change, and I'm going to go back to me on the screen. Um, this kind of change required kind of aging is humbling a bit. Um, I spend a lot more time having to take care of myself. And I'm a little, when I was preparing this sharing tonight, it takes me longer than it used to. I cannot believe that every week of the year, practically, I was giving a Sunday sermon, um, working with a board, with staff, doing memorials, doing all that. That's no longer my experience. It's really much slower, but it's so much richer. And that I'm really grateful for. So this Richard Rohr says something about this, and I'd like to read it to you. He says, God puts us in a world of passing things where everything changes and nothing remains the same. The only thing that doesn't change is change itself. It's a hard lesson to learn. It helps us appreciate that everything is a gift. We didn't create it. We don't deserve it. It will not last. But while we breathe it in, we can enjoy it. And we know that it is another moment of God, another moment of life. If religion isn't leading us into the eternal now, an eternal moment, an always true moment, an always love moment, then we have not lived the moment at all. I love that. And I love it because 
one of the blessings of aging is that I have more time to do that, to live in that eternal moment, um, that another God moment of life. Um, the trick is to do that in a way when we're facing some of the challenges of aging. How do we keep in that place um, being able to understand the impermanence, the reality of the impermanence that, and this is something I say to myself, it's a hard thing to say, but it's something that makes life so precious. And that is to say that everything, every person that I love, and there are a lot of them, um, I'm gonna say goodbye to, or they're gonna say goodbye to me. And that doesn't make it bad, it just makes it even more to know there's that eternity to our connection. So we might need to acknowledge, I, I made a list of different things that I need to acknowledge, like um, some of the hard lessons he talks about that Richard Rohr says about changing, that life is continually changing and I'm physically changing and mentally changing and for the most part mentally in a really great way. Um, the great thing about aging is that um, I'm becoming a little more authentic, um, honest, playful, because I had so much on my plate before the last few years. Um, I feel more awakened and um, aware of the beauty around me. And also I'm more aware of the need um, to have some finishing, some end, some healing endings in my life. I mean, there are places where I've left some rough edges that, um, that I'll have an opportunity during this time when I have so much more time to clean up and to love into fullness. So the things I broke down though, is some of the attachments that kind of get in my way into this very next 30 plus years of living, of sizzling as Charles Fillmore would say. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna be letting go of the need to feel as attractive, as strong at times, that my libido is different. And um, Ram Dass said this funny thing. I watched a thing of his long a while ago. And he said that um, he no longer had much interest in sex. And what a blessing that was. And the whole crowd just breaks out laughing. He said, I never realized how much time it took up, took up in my life. So he said, now I'm just so much more free. Um, so there is some, there's the silver lining there. Um, although he said it's wonderful if at 90 you still have a strong libido. Um, maybe I'm not feeling as competent all the time and what I'm doing, it, I work harder at it. Um, maybe not as relevant or as powerful. A big one, independent. Wondering at what point, since I took care of my parents for a long time, my dad for like 15 years, um, I wondered there would be a time when I may not be independent. And can I find God in that? Can I find God in all these different things? My energy level changing, my need for naps, my forgetting things. That's a big one, forgetting names and all sorts of things that I forget. Um, I'm not worried about running out of money, um, but I can understand that that's a fear. Um, I discovered that with my parents. I thought they were gonna run out and you know, it all worked out. It was amazing how that happened. I'm not gonna be a bag lady under the bridge. One of my girlfriends used to say that. She'd say, I'm saving up all my money because I'm, I'm gonna be a bag lady under the bridge. Most likely not. Um, but sometimes we might have a fear of being alone, something we can change. Um, my body having higher maintenance I, I'm recording a, a thing. Thank you. Um, that somebody just came in to, to. And so Ram Das said that part of it is us not feeding the drama of um, all these things, all these possibilities. Things are going to change. Um, and knowing that 
we, that our age is not who we are. So um, Krishnamurti was asked by his followers, why was he so peaceful? And his answer was, you want to know my secret? I don't mind what happens. So I thought about that and I thought, I probably will mind some of the things that happen, but wouldn't it be great to work with that, to work with that idea that I'm getting less minding of what happens, that I'm living in a spiritual sense of openness, um, that I'm getting more comfortable in my skin, in my life, when I was in college, I had a friend, and for some reason we talked about dying. 20 year old, then we were talking about dying. And so we said, he, he said, I said, well, what would be if you were quadriplegic? Wouldn't that be just the end? And he said this to me, and it stayed my whole life. He said, if I could feel the sun on my face, I would decide to be happy. I didn't get that too much at 20. I thought, are you nuts? No way that I'm going to feel. But, you know, as I'm getting older and I'm slowing down, I'm finding so many blessings when I was such in a hurry when I was young to get everything done that I didn't notice. And I have a feeling that as I give up some things, there are going to be some new things that are really going to make a difference in my life. Um, so part of it, it, this journey is to decide that aging and sickness and dying are, are not a bad thing, that it's just our natural process. So can we do it? Can we do both the aging process and the dying process with this amazing presence about us? And um, if we do that, if we do that, then what will happen is we'll do that for everyone else around us, for our children, our friends. Um, we'll teach them how to live well and how to die well. And especially in the consciousness that we are at this present time as we age, I think we have more um, compassion and understanding for people that are younger. And on the way, there was a woman that made a big difference in my life and uh, two women actually, and they were both elderly. And one just died two years ago at 100 years old. And her name was Muriel James. And you might have read her books a long time ago. I took her workshops through Unity. Um, she had best-selling Born to Win and Reparenting um, were books. And they helped me with some of my family issues. But more than that, her consciousness was so bright in her 60s when I took her thing and so amazing just to be around her shifted my idea of what somebody could be as we age. Um, so I want to be that. <laughs> I want to do that. Some experience one of my experiences when I was in Kansas City and becoming ordained and everything taking all the classes is that I was required to take hospice training and they paired me with very senior hospice people and this one was a was a Presbyterian minister who was retired and now decided to do hospice and the experiences that he and I had together just shifted everything about how aging could be so there were three people that really that we visited that kind of had had this experience. One was a woman who was going, was terminal, but she was still very healthy, could get around, but she had locked herself up in a room and she was angry and mad. Now, some of that's normal. I mean, but the, the hospice um, uh, chaplain said that she had decided that that was the end of her life and she would die in this room um, grudgingly angry at what her body had done and he said she could have been out living this these last months but she'd given up another woman we visited another elderly woman had a large large family but she could no longer get out of the nursing home and so we talked about that and she said i'm not useful anymore um 
my family, I used to do all the cooking. I did this for this large family. And she just went on and on. And so out of my mouth as being pretty naive and young and not a reverend yet, I just said, but you have the time to pray for them. I said, your family's so busy and what a blessing that would be. And she was just like, you could just see that shift for her and for me, because I didn't even know where that thought came from, um, that there's always a part we can play in the life of other people. Maybe it's not the same one. And that's the hard part that Richard Rohr talks. There's a hard part about things changing, um, but it could be the part of our spiritual journey that's just perfect for us if we would allow this infinite idea of possibilities. Um, so the third, and this one is a little hard, but I'm going to share it with you because part of living is appreciating dying. And this little boy was dying at 19. He was about the size of a nine year old. He had a skin disease that left that never healed. His skin never healed. And we visited him and he was wrapped from head to toe, except for you could see his eyes and his mouth. And that was it. He was a light. He, um, he radiated this beauty from inside and he was so proud that he'd lived long enough to graduate from high school and that his graduation program at this point he was already in a wheelchair and the, by the time we met him he could no longer be in a wheelchair and uh we're recording in here you want to sit down and listen you we're looking for the music okay um that's this is the first night I've had lots of people come in and are looking for something else. Um, and he was so pleased that he, on that wheelchair, he went on a Disney cruise. He would tell us all these stories and ask us what was going on outside. And so I realized that I had an opportunity to do things in all different ways, um, living and dying. And each of those three people gave me a different idea about what that's gonna be like for me. So COVID-19 kind of has taught us some of that. And uh, it's probably pointed out that individualism that we so honor in our country isn't the whole story. In fact, um, we are really interdependent on each other. And what science tells us is that when we come together, and especially as we age, I think this is going to become even more important, is um, that we, that our hard wiring for connection just infuses us with a vitality that we may not realize. In fact, when science experiments tell us that when we're at home, like watching Netflix and we laugh, that when we're with someone else, we laugh five times as much. And there's a word, one of the scientists calls this collective effervescence. Isn't that a pretty cool word? It's the pioneering sociologist, um, Emil um, Durkheim. And he was in the 20th century, and he, dis he discovered that there's a harmony and energy that moves in between people when they come together with a shared purpose. And that an almost synchronicity and heart rates and everything evolves from us being together. And so I just realized that as, you know, there was a book, what, a few years ago called Bowling Alone. And it was talking about how our country, we've really isolated ourselves. And yet the, our health depends, especially this next part of our lives on our um, collective of us honoring that collective effervescence that's part of us. There was also a book I read uh, quite a few years ago, maybe it's been like eight years ago, and it was called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Maybe a lot of you have read it. And they had an interesting story uh, to take it from the 1950s. It, and an outlier is something that doesn't make sense, that you just can't explain it. Scientists could not figure out how this small group in the 1950s, now this was before heart 
medicine, statins and all those things that made us let or bypass surgery and all those. And there was a group in Pennsylvania called the Rosetto Group. And they had come over from Italy along like 100 years before and settled in this one area and had this very tight knit community. Um, and nobody could figure out why some of them went to this, this community, but others kind of moved into the regular culture of the US and got more integrated with that. Well, the ones that stayed in this small community had unheard of heart problems, even into their 60s, it just didn't show up at all. And yet the other parts of their community that moved out and assimilated with the others. And so the scientists said, well, do they eat healthier? What is it that they do that no one else does? And it was actually the exact opposite. And I'll read you. Um, they had a 35% um, less after over 65, they had a 35% lower death rate, no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction and little crime. And they mostly died of old age. And, the, and their dietary practices were they cooked with lard, lard, ate heavy meats, 41% of their calories were from fat, smoked heavily, and struggled with obesity. So they thought, well, maybe it's genetic. But of course, these other ones from the same area were having lots of heart attacks and were dying young. And so they the the even people in nearby towns had three times the heart attacks um, and died much younger. So here's what the sociologists noted in this thing. They were connected with community. They chatted, they eat, ate together. They had three generations in a household. I might object to that. Um, but they had a respect for old age. Um, they had 22 civic organizations in a town of 2000. It, they were egalitarian. They discouraged showing of wealth, and they helped unsuccessful, obscure failures. So they helped people that were unsuccessful or had obscure failures. They would help lift them up in their community, and that their church was a unifying and calming effect on their lives. So they seemed to be insulated from stress from the world. So basically, the final line was, they were nourished by people. Now, Janine and I were at a concert, and she might not remember this a couple years ago, and there was this, uh, it was a radio show that was showing, was at Chautauqua, but the radio show, kind of like Prairie Home Companion radio show. And we were sitting behind somebody, and the singer up there was, said something about his grandpa, smoked all the time, ate bacon every day, and lived to 99. And there was a guy in front of us that said, yeah, but if he'd been a vegan, he would have lived to 110. And she and I just cracked up. So I, I don't want to say that you can eat 41%. You know, if you've got lots of friends and you're and um, you're just having a ball in your life, I would still um, consider maybe not the 41% fat. But um, anyhow, um, a, a medieval monk said this about in a book called Spiritual Friendship. But this is just amazing quote from it to me. How happy, how carefree, how joyful you are if you have a friend with whom you talk as freely as with yourself, to whom you neither fear or confess any, any fault, nor brush at, blush at revealing any spiritual progress, to whom you may entrust all the secrets of your heart and confide all your plans. And what is more delightful than to so unite spirit to spirit, and so to make one out of two. And there is neither fear of boasting nor dread of suspicion. A friend's correction does not cause pain. A friend's praise is not considered flattery. Beautiful description. So I want to, I'm looking at the time, and I want to talk a little about um, the idea that we're eternal. And um, this is a quote about um, eternal beings. And this is from Andrew Harvey. 
and from The Essential Mystic, one of his great books. And he, and just a little background, from in the Hindu tradition, Harvey explains that for the Hindus, Brahman is considered to be the eternal essence or eternal being. And so he quotes this about our eternal existence. In the city of Brahman is a secret dwelling, the lotus of the heart, as great as the infinite space beyond is the space within the lotus of the heart. Never fear that old age will invade that city. Never fear that this inner treasure of all reality will wither and decay. This knows no age when the body ages. This knows no dying when the body dies. This is the real city of Brahman. This is the self free of old age from death and grief, hunger and thirst. So I never have really spent much time thinking about that, uh, about eternal. I know some people really want to know about that. Like, are we, do, are we rebirth? Do we come back? Um, what happens afterwards? And that hasn't been much of an interest but, and some of you I've shared this with before, that um, my mom had a hard life and she had a lot of pain in the last five years of her life. And it was really sad when she died. And it was sad and happy too, because happy because she'd suffered and I wanted her to end, but sad because of all the pain. And it just, I was just devastated for a while and could barely catch my breath when she died. I was picking her up at the hospital on the way there she died as I was coming to get her from the hospital. I thought I was bringing her home. Um, but a few months later, she came to me and um, in a dream. Now, I could say that's just my mind and my imagination thinking she came and my dad and I, um, he lived another five years beyond her. Um, we'd go to concerts all the time. I'd take him to big band. He just loved big band. And it was so fun to watch him, he's blind, but he just had such a fun time. And in this dream, there's an intermission and I go out into the hall and um, my mom's there. And she says, I'm sitting in another section. You can't join me where I'm at, but it's wonderful. And I'm just having this wonderful time. So you, you, you and dad are gonna have to wait before you can join me. And then she hugged me. Now I have to tell you, my mother was one of these people that pat you on the back, like, don't touch me too much. She had some issues about being touched. And um, she held me and love poured, it poured through me, poured. And I woke up with this and it just kept pouring and pouring way after I woke up. And so that was kind of my message from her one that she was okay. But also that just made me think, well, you know, there might be something that's very interesting for us. Um, I don't know, my dad's never come to me. He's been gone for five years now. Um, I don't need him to come to me, but it felt like a gift. And I've talked to other people that have had gifts similar to that. There's no rhyme or reason. Why did she come to me? Why did dad, know? why don't some people come to us at all? Uh, my dad was happier, I think. Um, maybe he didn't need to tell me that. Um, but it just reminds me that just as Andrew Harvey said, we are just not our bodies or even all the things that have happened to us, there is something very eternal about us. I don't need to know the form, but um, I do understand the grace of that, how beautiful that is. So there's a poem I'll read about that, um, about this eternal, and this poet, William Stafford, calls it a thread. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop 
times unfolding. But you don't ever let go of the threat. So I want to make a couple little recommendations. There's a book that I've just started, but it's so profound. And it's um, called uh, From Aging to Saging. And it's, it's by a, um, a rabbi, Zalman, and let's see if I can say this, Shaltler Shalom Me. Shalom Me. And it says, From Aging to Saging, a revolutionary approach to growing older. And so if you really want to go deep into this and are thinking about, you know, I, there's some other things I might want to consider that now that I'm aging, how this is really about my spiritual journey, this aging process, and what a gift it can be to me and to others, I would recommend that book. So I'm going to finish with a little story. And this, some of you might have seen this. It's a film from quite a few years ago, but it just touched, the last part of it touched me. It was a pretty funny film. And it was called The Bucket List. And um, Jack Nicholson star and Morgan Freeman star in this. So I'm just gonna go and show you their pictures just cause I, I wanna share them. They were so cute. Um, there's their picture and it just it brings back such memories because i've thought about this ending several times and so jack nicholson plays edward cole a billionaire um, who has had everything hand handed but most people would call him not a nice person i won't swear but not a nice person and then carter chambers is morgan freeman and so they have landed together in a, ho in a um, hospital room. And um, Edward is the, mil the billionaire is very mad because he, he actually donated all the money for this hospital. And he was supposed to have a private room and fancy, but something happened and they had to put him in this room. And of course, C Carter Chambers um, is a car mechanic and has a totally different life experience. But they're both told they're terminal and they decide to escape from the hospital together and live the last few months of their lives going through a bucket lift. So they're traveling over Europe, they're traveling everywhere, they're having adventures, drinking, women, I mean, all the fun things. Um, but at some point, it kind of gets serious because Morgan Freeman's character, um, Carter, it just starts getting wanting to know more about Edward and why he isn't connected to his daughter. And this makes Edward mad. Edward is like, this is supposed to be fun. We're not, we are, we just did this for fun. And so um, this is Carter talking to Edward saying, Edward, I have had more baths, baths that are deeper than you. Because of course, Edward didn't want to share his his any part of it being a healing process. Like you said, he would just want fun. So Edward Cole says back to Carter Chambers, I built a billion dollar business up from nothing. Presidents have asked my advice. I have dined with royalty and I'm supposed to make out like what? This trip was supposed to mean something to me? Like it was going to change me? How did you see this playing out, Carter? I knock on the door, she answers. She's surprised and angry, but I tell her how much I love and miss her. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna die soon. So I'm reaching out to you because I don't wanna die alone. Carter says back to him, everyone's afraid to die alone. Edward, I'm not everyone. This was supposed to be fun. That's all it ever was. So they separate. And Carter later read, writes this letter to Edward. Dear Edward, I've gone back and forth the last few days trying to decide whether or not I should even write this. In the end, I realize I would regret it if I didn't. So here it goes. 
I know the last time we saw each other, we weren't exactly hitting the sweetest notes. Certain wasn't, certainly wasn't that way. And I wanted the trip to end. I suppose I'm responsible for that. I'm sorry. But in all honesty, if I had the chance, I'd do it again. Virginia said I left a stranger and came back a husband. I owe that to you. There's no way I can repay you for all that you've done for me. So rather than try, I'm just going to ask you to do something else for me. Find the joy in your life. You once said you're not everyone. Well, that's true. You certainly not everyone, but everyone is everyone. My pastor always says our lives are streams flowing into the same river toward whatever heaven lies in the midst beyond the falls. Find the joy in your life, Edward. My dear friend, close your eyes and let the water take you home. And then the character Carter makes his transition. And this is Edward at his um, celebration of life. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Cole. I don't know what most people say at these occasions, because in all honesty, I have tried to avoid them. The simplest thing is I loved him and I miss him. Carter and I saw the world together, which is amazing when you think that only three months ago we were complete strangers. I hope that doesn't sound selfish of me, but the last months of my life were the best of his life were the best months of mine. He saved my life and he knew it before I did. I'm deeply proud that this man found it worth his while to know me. In the end, I think it's safe to say we brought some joy to each other's lives. So one day when I go to some final resting place, if I happen to wake up next to a certain wall with a gate, I hope that Carter's there to vouch for me and show me the ropes on the other side. And then there's a picture of um, Edward's uh, a headstone, and you can hear Carter's voice. Edward Perryman Cole died in May. It was, a, it was a Sunday in the afternoon, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. He was 41, 41, 81 years old. Even now, I can't claim to understand the measure of a life, but I can tell you this. I know when he died, his eyes were closed and his heart was open. So as Ram Das says, we're here to walk each other home. From the moment we were born, we were here to walk each other home. So if we think life's a game, then there's a point where we're going to be putting the pieces back into the box and um, somebody's going to do our eulogy. So for now, I'm remembering in this next stage of my life that I'm writing it day by day. And not only am I writing it, but I'm loving it. So bless all of you for coming. And um, we're going to take a little time when I stop our um, recording. <laughs>